essentially. It's, it's interesting how during the presidency of George W. Bush and, and just before it, we saw this uh, major effort to conflate George W. Bush and his father's presidency with that of John Quincy Adams and John Adams. And, you know, to his credit, John Quincy Adams was arguably one of the most, you know, high-minded ethical presidents and politicians of the, of the 19th century, you know, of that entire era. And he was defeated by, by uh, Andrew Jackson, who basically uh, called him a limp-wristed wimp. Uh, he was, he was uh, John Quincy Adams was very educated and he was very opposed to slavery, so much so that after he lost the presidential election and was no longer president, lost the election to Andrew Jackson, he ran for Congress and went back into the U.S. House of Representatives just so he could break the law and bring up the issue of slavery every single day. So anyhow, into this, uh, this modern maelstrom steps Bradley J. Berzer. He is a professor of history and the Russell Kirk Chair in American Studies. Uh, Russell Kirk, of course, the author of The Conservative Mind back in 1951, the book that kicked off the modern conservative movement. He's a co-founder and editor-at-large of the Ameri Imaginative Conservative. His website, Brad Berzer, B-I-R-Z-E-R.com, and you can tweet him at Bradley Berzer uh, Hill, at, Hill, at Hillsdale College. Uh, Dr. Berzer, welcome back to the pro or welcome to the program. <laughs> Thanks so much, Tom. I'm really glad to be here. Thank you. I, you know, you have written a book in defense of Andrew Jackson, and I, I'm just baffled by this. This guy was a hypocrite. He was a moral <laughs> coward. He was a slave owner, and over the years, he, he, you know, he when he first bought uh, 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 the Hermitage, uh, he had uh, ten slaves there. By the time he died, he had 150. Uh, he was in the business. He uh, is a probable rapist. Uh, he, he, he was a fan of genocide when he, when he, was, uh, when he had taken New Orleans. He had people executed just because they, they upset him. Uh, how, how could anybody defend this man? Oh, yeah, thanks, Tom. I mean, there's certainly, there's so many things about Jackson that are problematic, if not downright wrong. And I think that that's, you know, that's a fair assessment. Part of what I was trying to do with the in defense of, and I like John Quincy Adams as well, in fact, I think he's the best man of that era. But part of what I was trying to do is just kind of move beyond some of the stereotypes that have really grown since the 1960s regarding Jackson, especially in terms of his Indian policy, and try and give it a little bit of context. So it, I know the title is in defense of, but it's really more let's see this guy in context and try and figure out what he was trying to do and how people responded to him. So, uh, for example, in 1830, he signed this law, the Indian Removal Act, which right. legalized ethnic cleansing. Within seven years, 46,000 human beings were removed from their homelands east of the Mississippi. This gave 25 million acres to uh, white settlement, which was all, virtually all, turned over to cotton and slavery, which is exactly what he wanted. The Cherokee, the Creek, uh, the Choctaw, the Chickasaw, the Seminoles. I mean, he declared war on the Seminoles, uh, you know, just, just kind of basically, you know, made this war up. You know, it's just, it's, it's, uh, I, I just, how can you, how can you put that in any kind of context? You know, at the time, the previous president, John Quincy Adams said what, what uh, Andrew Jackson was doing was criminal. Yeah, you know, again, it, it is hard to defend in so many ways. So part of the context, if I can think about this and try and think about it as objectively as possible, which is not always easy as a historian, but when we look at Jackson and the Indian Removal Act, obviously the consequences of that were just disastrous. And you know, no more so, I think, I mean, the Choctaw proved how disastrous it was. Yeah, the removal, they died, almost a third of the tribe died en route to Oklahoma. Another third, or at least a half of that remaining, died that first winter. Yeah, it was a bureaucratic nightmare in every way. And it would be so difficult to imagine being a survivor of that, you know, knowing that two out of every three of the people you know is gone. So I don't think there's a lot of justification for it. The only thing that I think is possible is to try and understand why Congress would have done this, why did they go along with the president? How was he able to push this? And to me, the fascinating aspect is that really, as Jackson was promoting this, so many people in America at the time were actually blaming him for being too pro-Indian and being an Indian lover because he was spending so much money on the Indians 
and giving them what they consider to be prime land as opposed to giving Wait a his his settlement. nicknames were Indian killer and sharp knife he was famous for for killing Indians I mean that's what he did back you know going after the Seminole uh, you know back before he was president uh, he, he he ordered after after they attacked the men and beat them he then ordered his soldiers to go in and burn the villages and murder the women and children so there would be no ancestors yeah, I mean, there, there you've got an example of frontier total war at its worst. And uh, Jackson, he did, uh, to say that he was against all Indians would be too, taking it too far. No, he adopted he one, did, but, certainly. but you know, that sure, doesn't, that, also, you know, that's sort of like, you know, the, you know saying, well, yeah, well, you know, uh, some of my best friends are, are Jewish or black or fill in the blanks. I mean, <laughs> that, that, it doesn't really wash. He did, though. It, uh, agreed. That could be taken in a lot of different ways. But he also allied himself with a number of Indians. And you know, when we look at what he did at the Battle of New Orleans, he had a number of Indians fighting on his side. So it was never a clear-cut distinction between those who were Native and those weren't, who weren't. Jackson uh, you know, was pretty clear about the way that he thought in terms of who could be in alliance and who couldn't. And often those decisions were fairly moral decisions based on how the tribe had behaved or what they were doing. But doesn't isn't this something that went back to Bradford in the 1620s of, of basically aligning with one tribe against another tribe to try and split them apart and then ultimately destroy both of them, even though you've got a temporary alliance with one tribe? Yeah, I mean, that's, why, that's a pretty cynical interpretation of it. But that's but how it played out. It's totally wrong. I mean, that's how it played out. There's, it there's did. you know, in large chunks of this country, there's no more Native Americans, and it used to be chock-a-block, right, full. You know, the other thing that I think, Tom, at least for me, that gives me a little bit of pause is uh, it is true that so many Southerners benefited from the removal. That, again, I don't think we can question. I think that's obvious. But Jackson also went against Southern interests very strongly with the nullification process in 1832 and 1833. So I mean, if he really was just adamantly pro-Southern, he really shot himself in the foot in a lot of ways. Well, he was ad adamantly pro-slavery, I think. But uh, let's let's take this to today. One of, one of the things that I find fascinating sure. about we're talking with uh, Brad Bradley Berzer. He's got a new book out called In Defense of Andrew Jackson. Um, uh, Andrew Jackson is Donald Trump's favorite president. And, you know, I, I don't know why. I don't, you know, know if it's because Andrew Jackson was a famous racist or because he killed so many Indians or because he owned so many slaves. I don't get it. But, uh, you know, he gave, he gave lip service to small government, but that's not certainly what he did. Um, I, I, how, what in your mind are the parallels between Jackson and Trump that make Jackson now an iconic figure for Trump followers? Sure. On, on one side, you've got, of course, all the scandals in terms of marriage, extramarital. Those things were going on in both administrations. And I, Trump, obviously, when it comes to morality and sexuality, he's kind of off the scale. Uh, but the other thing that I think shows that there's connectedness, not just their Scottish background, but also the fact that each of them is a very unusual president. That is, they, they really don't fit the norm. They are outsiders who came in and really did challenge a lot of assumptions in Washington, D.C. I can speak better on Jackson than I can on Trump, but I mean, certainly Jackson was very feared in Washington, D.C., not just because he was brutal, and he was, but also because he really was willing to call something. And when he thought it was wrong, he was very open about that. And he did change. I mean, there were a lot of drastic changes in Washington during his two terms. Well, Jackson, you know, in his in his uh, right after his inaugural, uh, you know, his his inaugural party was at the White House. And he basically opened the doors and said anybody can come in. And in fact, people came in and they stole pieces of the White House. Um, that, you know, it was widely viewed as sort of a raucous time, shall we say. Trump comes into office on the same kind of populist rhetoric. I'm here for you. I'm here for the little guy. But then he doesn't let the people in. And in fact, to get into any of his inaugural balls, you have to be a high end donor. He fills his cabinet with lobbyists, which is you know, quite different than what Jackson did. Um, he surrounds himself and funds himself with, with billionaires. He himself is a billionaire. Andrew Jackson wasn't, although his wealth increased. It, it, I think you could make a strong case that virtually 100 percent of Andrew Jackson's wealth was a result of being a slave owner. Um, it, doesn't that, you know, with any kind of a close look, doesn't that comparison break down quite quickly? 
Yeah, probably. Uh, I think that, you know, and it's not something I dwelt upon at all in the book, just making a note that certainly Trump, when he came into office and then on the, the 250th anniversary of Jackson's birth, that he really did celebrate that. And it was an interesting speech that Trump gave that day. So, yeah, I mean, that's the real connection. I think just the fact that they one is interested in the other. Yeah. Yeah, it's fascinating stuff. Uh, the book is in, in, in Defense of Andrew Jackson. Uh, Bradley Berzer is the author. The book is out now. Bra uh, BradBerzer.com is his website. Brad, thanks a lot for dropping by today. Oh, thank you, Tom. Really appreciate it. My pleasure. Good talking with you. And, uh, you know, fascinating topic.